if instead of looking up to those guys who you don't have in your facility, if you can just say, all right, the people who are successful here, this is what they do. All right. And now all of a sudden they're kind of falling in line. So we have, we have incredible buy-in and I think it's for that reason. Welcome everybody. This is Scott Hassey with Indiana Twins and we are having John O'Neill on today for episode 21 of ITTV. Uh, just a few quick rundowns. If you are not following us on any social media, it is just at Indiana Twins across the board. Uh, also YouTube, it is youtube.com slash Indiana Twins. And we are on, I mean, just basically about everything. Also, if you want to email us for any questions, whether it's about the show or something with John or just anything in general, it is indianatwins at gmail.com. So we try to keep it straight across the board. This will be uploaded in a few days by the end of the week uh, on the YouTube. It will have timestamps underneath. So under the show more on YouTube, it will have timestamps. Uh, basically, all the topics we talk about will be kind of um, organized in a sequential order. So you'll be able to click the time and skip around if you want. If you miss something or want to go back to it, it will be there as a reference. So with that said, I'm going to just touch on a few things with John's background, kind of his LinkedIn or resume. Um, so he is currently the director of performance at Cressy Sports Performance in Hudson, Mass. And he's been a high school coach, a Legion ball coach. He's interned at Ranfone Training Systems with the Baltimore Orioles. And where I want to start is he graduated from Dickinson College with a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics in 2014. So, John, what in the world were you doing in 2014 with a math degree and some type of interest in baseball? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, I'm actually, Dickinson College, from a lot of your followers probably don't even know of it, but I'm actually repping it right now. But um, So, I went there, graduated 2014. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to get into. And so, one of the reasons I went there, um, well, two reasons. One was I had no idea what I wanted to study. And so, I went to a school that you didn't have to pick a major right away. And it seemed to have stuff all across the board. Um, I still don't know what I want to do when I, when I get older, but this is what I'm doing right now. Um, but at that time, I really didn't know. Um, the other things I wanted to play. So I had two shoulder surgeries in high school, high school then right after. And it was like getting recruited after shoulder surgeries, multiple of them. It was like near impossible. And so I was like, all right, I just want to go somewhere where they tell, they'll tell me I can play, right? Um, it's also a good academic school and kind of fit in that front. So I chose it, you know, um, I don't want to say on a whim because that sounds bad, but I definitely made one visit and was like, all right, yep, that's where I'm going. Um, and so I know a lot of kids go through a lot more of a process than that, but um, went there, really enjoyed my time. Um, I knew I've always, I've, I've w always wanted a job, something to do with sports. Um, so I know at, at times when I was younger, obviously when you're 10 years old, you want to play in the big leagues. You realize a couple years later, that's probably not realistic um, if you're like me, but um, went through periods where I wanted to be a, a sports journalist. I uh, actually wrote for our college newspaper, was sports editor on the college newspaper. So kind of continued that through college. Um, wanted to go into some kind of uh, broadcasting or radio. I've always been fascinated by sports radio. So I actually looked into that at one point. Uh, I never, it's going to sound strange, but I never wanted to be the, like the lead voice on it. I always wanted to be the guy behind the scenes, just being the guy, the stats. Because if yeah. it's like you're telling me there's a job where you just look at baseball stats and, and give them to people who want to argue over them, that sounds like a cool job. Um, and I guess the, the third one within there that I realized could actually be a career path or a realistic career path um, was working front office stuff in pro baseball. So um, where I went to school was actually where um, Andy McPhail went with the Orioles, uh, president of the Orioles for years. Um, and so our school had a connection of, of getting an internship with the Orioles. And so I was actually the second one, um, second one that was in still in school at the same time. So a kid who was a senior when I was a freshman and there was a kid a couple of years before him who interned with the Orioles somewhere in between college. And I found out that was a thing. I was like, all right, I want to do that. I actually found out that was a thing before declaring my major. And at that time I had just taken classes all across the board. Um, I don't want to say I hated school, uh, but I definitely didn't love school. Um, school was just something you, you had to do. And I like reading things. I like learning things, but not, I don't necessarily like being told what to read and learn and when, and at what pace to do it. Um, and so kind of looking into that, I was like, all right, I can intern with the O's or there's a chance I could intern with the O's next summer. This is like a year before. Um, and then I was like, all right, so, um, what would, what would progress me within that field faster? And you, at that point, I could have majored in like eight different things. And, and math was actually always my best subject growing up. My mom was a math professor still. And um, I didn't really like it at all. But I was like, all right, I can, I can do the work for this. I'm sure I'll be okay at it. 
And I know that being a math major and front office in Major League Baseball, you'll, you'll have a chance of progressing faster than someone with an unrelated major. Um, and so I chose that. Um, it was a very long-winded answer, but summer 2012, intern with the Orioles. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. So I think sometimes when people go, to, go into something and then don't pursue it, it's like, oh, they must have not liked it. I actually loved that internship. Um, had a great time. It was most of the summer in um, short season A, Aberdeen. Um, was in Baltimore a couple times, behind the scenes, meeting guys, doing a bunch of basically dirty work for the organization. Like, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Um, and so within that, I actually – so my internship, I was supposed to be there uh, for a 7 o'clock game. I was supposed to be there at 4 o'clock. And I was supposed to be there from 4 until like an hour after the game. So usually like 11 o'clock, somewhere in that neighborhood. I would always have work to do when I went home. So like my main task, and I don't even know if this job exists anymore because I feel like the technology is updated so much. But my main task was with a, with a camera tripod and like an like a old school camcorder, um, just moving around the stands and getting coaches view angles of players throughout the game. And so every pitch that one of our pitchers threw, I recorded. And not just recorded, but like recorded as an individual file from multiple angles so that at the end of the game, the coach could look at mechanics or like mechanical video on guys. Um, same thing with hitters. So you had like your hot spots of where I'd move around the stands, but I spent all game, all, all game, every game that summer doing that after the game would wind up uploading. Um, and again, I don't even know if they still do this, but they, they had at the time a company Dropbox account. And so everyone from Dan Duquette, who was the GM all the way down to me could access the Dropbox account. Right. And, Dropbox account had all 200-ish players in the organization. And if you clicked on a player, you could, up, you could look at every single swing that they took that year, right? Or you could look at every single pitch they threw. And so my job was to take the camera files, upload them, and sort them every night. And so that would take like one to two hours after every game. Um, but I'm, I'm originally from New Jersey. So I was living in Maryland all summer. Um, didn't, didn't have a whole lot to do before 4 o'clock, right? And so – um, I started just showing up to the ballpark at 12. I was like, all right, what's the earliest someone shows up here? And someone's like 12 o'clock. I'm like, all right, I'll go in at 12. And so I just go in at 12, hang out, kind of watch what people are doing, see if there's anything I could do. Um, the strength coach would usually start at two o'clock with guys. And at the time I was into training, but I was into training for myself. Um, I had no, I didn't really know it was like a career path or like a, something that people actually did um, for a career. Obviously, you know, there are trainers, but you don't know there's how many there are. Um, or what the route is to become one. So I, at two, uh, the two o'clock, they would start lifting. And so I'd kind of like hover on the edge of the weight room for a couple of days. And like two weeks in, the guy's like, hey, you're, I could use an extra set of hands if you want to like help out. And um, I didn't actually coach, but he's like, if you want to just help guys, kind of orient them, tell them what an exercise is, um, help them rack weights, clean benches, whatever it was. He's like, I could use an extra hand. He was a one-man show, right, in the minor leagues. And so from like that became, cause I didn't have to do anything till four. So that became from two to four every day that summer. I would just basically volunteer in the weight room. Um, and actually, I don't know if I should be saying this, but they, it was a paid internship, but they were only allowed to pay you for six hours a day. And so I wound up working like 12 hour days, like 10 to 12 hour days for six hours pay at like Maryland minimum wage. Um, and and so it was fun, though. I had a blast. I was 21 at the time. Like, I was kind of the same age as a lot of the players. We weren't allowed to, like, socialize with them outside of there. But I was just around guys my age, around some coaches who had spent some time in the big leagues. So, like, hearing stories about them were, were always cool. Um, this is a little bit of a side note. I know it's long-winded, but this is actually a funny story. So this dude named – guy named Alan Mills, great guy. So he pitched, he pitched 12 years in the big leagues. He was our pitching coach that year. And – uh, I knew he, he played on the Orioles in the 90s, right? I grew up a Yankees fan. And so those, that was a heated rivalry, like 95, 96, 97. And the oh, Orioles yeah. started to tail off. And the first baseball fight I ever saw was this fight, 1998 in Yankee Stadium. You had um, Armando Benitez on the, on the Orioles. Uh, who was it? Bernie Williams hits a home run. He drills Tino Martinez just out of frustration. And both benches clear. And so in my head, like I had just met this guy. We're like three days into working together. I'm like, oh, you were you were on the Orioles in 98. He's like, yeah, why? He's like, uh, I was like, oh, we're, do you remember a fight in Yankee Stadium? And I was like, I remember watching that. And he, like, looks at me, and he's, like, 6'4", 240, big guy, real angry look. And he's like, did you look me up on Wikipedia? And I'm just like, I, I had no idea. I had, and I looked him up, and it, he has, like, a whole section on Wikipedia 
just talking about his involvement in the brawl. He spent 12 years in the big leagues, was very successful, and Wikipedia remembers him for, like, for punching Daryl Strawberry in this brawl. <laughs> and so I had no idea. But anyway, going back, um, the – uh, with the strength coach, I wound up being like, oh, this is really cool. And, and seeing kind of the stuff that was being done on the analytics end and the stuff that was being done on the strength end, the strength stuff wasn't bad. It was actually really standard at the time. Um, so really straightforward, really simple. Everybody got the same program. They didn't ask about injury history, um, stuff like that, right? And so, and I kind of saw like this big gap of information. And so um, kind of this, this, more mathematical mindset of like, all right, you're looking at a, a problem from a bird's eye view. Uh, what, what is the thing that's the easiest thing to change within this, within this problem? Like, are you going to try to change the thing that's, that's light years ahead of everything else? Or are you going to try to change the low hanging fruit? And so I looked at it at the end of that summer. I'm like, man, if I could get into baseball training, um, baseball training and really learn about it and really approach it from a, um, a mindset of like, uh, from an outsider's view, and so sometimes people look at it as, oh, you didn't go to school for this. Um, how do you know this stuff? Like, how do you really know this stuff? And then I'll ask people back, what do you use in your undergrad today? And the answer is probably very little, right? And so maybe your undergrad helped you in your first couple months in the job. But most of what you do is probably a combination of what you learned after you graduated and what you actually do day to day. And that's probably similar in other fields. I think the, the degree often just gets you a step in the door. Um, but I, I looked at it as like, all right, I can get into, like if I can get into training and training baseball players, like I think I could really make a difference, right? So that's, that's the way I thought of it. Um, and so I, I originally, and then I looked at it and it's like, all right, you know, uh, physical therapists make more than strength coaches easier to make a good living as a physical therapist until you're 55, 60 years old. Yep. Um, strength coaches, you know, often have these long arduous routes to get there. Um, and so the, the, I spent the next probably year and a half thinking I'd be a PT, um, took the next summer, declined the I didn't, uh, invite to come back with the Orioles, um, declined it because I wanted to take uh, classes for, P for PT school. So I spent my summer taking like bio one, bio two, AMP one, AMP two, um, was lined up to take physics and chemistry the next, the next summer and then apply for PT school. And I know like late and it was late to late in that school year. I was so over school. Like you're, I mean, when you're a senior in college, you're, you are, you're what, 16 years into, into going to school every day. And it was like April of that year. And I was graduating in May. I'm like, I cannot take these classes this summer. I was like, mentally, I can't go to physics labs and chemistry labs and whatnot. Like I just mentally can't do it. I'm like, what is my route towards getting a good job in training baseball players that doesn't involve going to all these classes? Um, and so I looked at it and interning in the private sector and they seemed to be the way you need most college internships. You need a degree in the field um, to, to get into, or you need to go become a GA to get into. Um, or just to get your foot in the door. And I was like, all right, if I intern in the private sector, um, then I can, you know, I can, I, I can kind of climb my way up that way. That was the way I looked at it. And I had spent probably at that point, I probably spent almost two years of just reading training stuff every day. And so like, I'm, uh, I'm blissfully unaware of some things in life, but when I'm locked in on something, I'll, uh, I'll read a ton about that or I'll just, I'll just get obsessed with that. Um, and so I spent the two years, my last two years of college, I spent probably more time reading training stuff than doing math homework. Um, and by that point I was like, I can, if I get an internship in the strength and conditioning field, I'm like, I can do a good job. Like I, I'm like, I'm convinced I can do a good job. And so I wound up finding, I applied to like over 40 places too. So I, I like, I spent days just emailing everyone I could find their email to in the field. Um, thinking like not realizing the kind of the hierarchy of jobs at that time. Um, and I actually, this is another funny story, but I, I looked at kind of what are the best, um, what are the best places to intern in the training sector? And I had, um, I'll, I'll mention this, I'll come back and mention this, but um, I lined up like some interviews for internships and um, my school was in central Pennsylvania. This internship was in um, Connecticut, like kind of middle or southeastern Connecticut, right? And so I know a lot of the listeners from Indiana. And so just geographically, this is like a six hour drive. And so they were like, all right, um, they didn't know where I was from because they weren't used to getting interviews from other states, right? 
And so they're like, all right, your interview is tomorrow at like 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. Like, all right, sounds good. And so I get in the car like three, four in the morning, drive up there, interview, start talking to the guy. And he was like, oh, did you graduate school yet? I'm like, no, I graduate. I, I was two days out from graduation. I'm like, I graduate in two days. He's like, oh, where do you go to school? He's like, oh, I've never heard of that. Where is it? Like central Pennsylvania. He's like, you're going back to graduation. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go back tonight. And that ended the interview right there. He's like, all right, do you want to intern here? I'm like, I don't really need to know any other questions. I'm like, if you're going to drive six hours to interview, it's yours. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was like, I was like, absolutely. I'm like, do you, can I, can I hang out for a little bit at least? Like see what it's like. So I hung out for like an hour and the guy actually was just like, go home, like leave. Like, go back to school, enjoy time with your friends. I can't hold you here any longer. I was like, all right. So I drove back that night, wound up interning there that summer, um, and wound up interning at CSP right after. Um, that was an extremely long answer to your question. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. So, I, I mean, I had some really lucky, fortunate situations happen, too. So when I was a freshman in college, I had the, I needed a student worker job just to have some money. I was either going to work in the cafeteria. There are two jobs available for freshmen on campus, the cafeteria or what was called a sports medicine student assistant. And so I didn't, I didn't know what a sports medicine student assistant was, but I'm like, that sounds more interesting. And so I applied for that, wound up doing that. It's basically like um, you would clean the training tables, fill up, fill up the water jugs, get practice field set up, et cetera. And I wound up working like 20 to 30 hours a week, my whole junior and senior year. I, I stopped playing after my sophomore year, but I um, wound up uh, 20, 30 hours working this job because the guy who I worked for was obsessed with training, just love training. So I'd show, I'd show up at work and I would just ask him questions for like three hours. And, and that was like my training, that was my work shift for, for two years. It's like the best, the most fun job I've ever had, um, making like 750 an hour. But um, so there's that. And then in 2011 or 2010, I think 2010, um, I had had my second shoulder surgery and, and it was a combination of things, mostly me just being an idiot in terms of my rehab. But, um, I started looking into baseball training and now when you search baseball training, I think you can find a bunch of places, a bunch of things. So I'm sure there's somewhere every state, um, that trains baseball players and advertise on the internet. 2010, if you Googled like baseball training, you found like bodybuilding.com articles that mentioned baseball. You found like random things like that. And I'm sure that's, that's the same in a lot of other sports, but um, the one name that kept coming up was Eric Cressy. And so summer 2010, I drive up there, or I email Eric, like, hey, I, I really want to get a program from you, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, all right, I don't do, he didn't do, we don't do distance-based programming like that. We do a little bit now, but very little. And so he's like, all right, I only do in-person assessments. Um, you know, in-person assessments are really valuable to me. We do that, then we train. I'm like, all right, cool. And so I drove up there. It was like a four-hour drive, got a program, learned it all a couple days, came back, did that a couple times that summer. And that's, that's kind of what got me into training, but I never thought of it like coaching until I was with the Orioles. And so um, I had that, I guess, connection with Eric. I'm, I'm sure he – I bet he remembered me, but not a whole lot because I was only there like three, four days and, but he's excellent with names. And so when I, uh, I was, I sh shot him an email, it's like summer 2014 and was like, Hey, um, I'm so-and-so not sure if you remember me. Um, I, you know, I, I'm really interested in this field. I'm looking to apply for your internship down the road. Just want to let you know. And I was actually trying to apply like a couple semesters later. Um, cause I wanted to intern work and then go back and intern just to have some money. And he actually called me. He reached out and called me. He was like, hey, we're opening this new spot in Florida. Um, it's not public information yet. Um, we don't have any interns for it. If you want to come down and intern there, um, it's yours. And I'm like, all right, cool. When's it start? It started in like two months. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'm in. And then I go back and check my bank account. I'm like, how do I make this work? Um, but it figured it out. Why don't we work like part-time jobs when I was down there? But I went right from ran phone training systems to CSP. When I left CSP, uh, wound up with a couple good jobs in between. Uh, but CSP has kind of always been the place when I got into the field, I was like, all right, I want to work at a place like that. High level baseball guys. Um, I like the private sector a lot. There's a lot more freedom and flexibility in terms of what you do. Um, but I guess probably since 2010, I've wanted to work here without really knowing it. Didn't really come to fruition until like 2014. Yeah. So, no, that's awesome. Um, what, and I always ask this question of guys that have gotten to work with um, or involved with in some different ways, uh, whether it's pro ball for pro ball players or an organization 
or like yourself right now with being at a place where there's programs coming in, yep. what has been kind of one of the cooler, either people you got to meet, experiences you had, or places you got to go, or interactions where you're like, this is just really, really cool? That's a great question. Um, the player side of it, to be honest, uh, this is going to sound bad, but the player side of it to me has never been super interesting. And for, it's always interesting, but it's never like, oh, my God, I met that guy. And I'll tell you the reason why. It was probably when I was younger, I knew from, you know, the time you're 12, 13, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm not going to be a major league baseball player. I just want to play for as long as I can. You know, maybe that realization hits a couple years later. But um, the guys who I always looked up to were like the radio announcers and the front office guys. And so when I meet those guys occasionally, and I haven't met most of the guys I want to meet, I'm always like, oh, this is so cool. Like, this is, this is amazing. But when I meet, like, like I, we, uh, like, Corey Kluber trains with us in the offseason. Corey's an awesome guy, like, 0% starstruck. And, that, and it doesn't add up. Like, uh, I met the Yankees, like, backup play-by-play -play guy, like, three years ago. And I thought it was, like, the coolest thing in the world. Like that to me was awesome. And so I, I'm just a little weird in that regard. I know with the, when I was with the O's, like meeting Cal Ripken briefly was, was really cool because it's Cal Ripken and um, never met Buck, but Dan Duquette was sat next to for a couple of games. Like things like that were always really cool to me. Um, but I think on the training side, it's never been, um, it's never really hit me like that. Um, where I worked in New York, and maybe it's partly with this too, where I worked in New York, we were known for, um, training celebrities, movie stars, actors, etc. And so, like, uh, Ryan Reynolds and, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix and all these guys, there's probably a dozen, 15, 15 of those guys that I wound up meeting while I was there. And that kind of numbs you to it. Um, yeah. Once you meet a few of those guys, it kind of numbs you to it. Like, Jennifer Aniston came in for a little bit. And the first day, I was like, oh, my God, it's Jennifer Aniston. She's got a bodyguard at both ends of the facility. She's da 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 It's like a whole, whole charade every time she comes in and out because – She's Jennifer Aniston living in New York City. She can't walk down the street. And, and so things like that were like, oh, this is, this is really wild. Um, but I think because of that, the baseball side of it has never hit me like that. Um, yeah. which, and, and I think the thing you realize is really quickly, the coaches who, who think like that and who are just like, you're just a normal dude who happens to play baseball, like you might be a school teacher, you might drive a bus for a living, whatever you do, like I'm just going to treat you the same way, like – we might not even talk about baseball. Like I talk more about non-baseball things than baseball things with our baseball guys. And so the coaches who can do that really well, um, I think are, are really attractive to those guys. Um, like I have a good relationship with a bunch of our pro guys. And I think it's because I don't treat them like celebrities or we don't just talk about how their two seam moves or, or whatnot. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and I, I see sometimes, so we run, we have an internship program, right, which I mentioned because I was part of, but I've been here about three years now. I've had a little or somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 interns. I'd have to count. It might be exactly 50. It's somewhere between like 48 and 52. Um, but the interns who treat those guys differently than they treat other people are not successful with them, you know, because the guys just don't want to deal with that. Like, um, then you're almost like, you almost like become a media member or like, all right, I'll talk to you sometimes, but not other times to them, as opposed to somebody who's like on their team, if that makes sense. So, um, I just, I just found that even when I was an intern, cause we had a lot of pro guys in Florida when I was there, when we first opened a big hotspot still is, but even then like day one, we opened down there, we had a bunch of pro guys, um, and I was there for four months, but even then that was not, um, just treating those guys normally. You want like, you wind up with much better results as a coach. Um, and I think that probably speaks volumes to any kind of coaching. Like if you're treating your star players differently than your, than your non-star players, you'll get the occasional star guy who likes that. But most of the time the star guy is like, this is weird. Just leave me alone. You know? And, and the non-star guys definitely notice that because the non-star guys are like, why does he give him preferential treatment? Uh -huh. um, and so that's, that's, that's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure if I have a great answer for it, but um, if was... I could, if you could, if you could set me up a meeting with like, Michael Kay, who's the Yankees play-by-play -play guy, or Mike Green, who does NBA games, one of those guys, I'd be starstruck. But the, on the player side, it's not it never been uh, never been that way for me. No, I mean, I did a little bit of research and listened to, I think it was three different podcasts, tried to do some reading around. I know you don't put out a lot of content, and you'd said that in one of the podcasts. Um, but within those, I didn't hear any of those. That was actually a really good answer. 
<laughs> and I want to go back to the internship program later. Yeah. But I want to dive into a little bit of training right now. Sure, and let's we'll do talk, it. Go back in the internship, and then we'll kind of end up after that. But so in regards to training, I know kind of your guys' sweet spot. You had mentioned in another podcast that about 50% of your population that's training is that high school age, which is perfect for our audience. Yep. So one of the things that struck me, which I know is very true with high school guys, they want to come in and they want to compare themselves to the elite of the elite, especially in your shoes. But even in our area, they say, okay, I want to be doing, you know, what Max Scherzer's doing, Justin Verlander's doing, what um, Roldis Chapman's doing. I want to do their training program. And they try to compare their, themselves to them, not realizing where they really are. And that combined with, I loved one of your assessment questions or initial questions to high school guys to find out kind of their training experience to say, when was the last time you worked out for three days for three, three months straight? So kind of combining that all in, when you get a guy, how do you bring him back down to earth? And then where do they start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I love I love that that was your takeaway from that because that's like what my favorite question to ask in the assessment. So like I used to ask like, oh, what's your training background? And people would say, oh, I've lifted weights with my dad. I've done this, this, and this. And, I, and honestly, it would mislead me. It would tell me, it would tell me like, all right, maybe he's not a true beginner. And then, but in reality, if you've never done it consistently, then then you're then you're then you're a beginner. Like you started at at, at, the, at the basement. You start you started on the ground floor, right? And so. It's the same thing. Like um, I like diet analogies from the standpoint that I think I think they're easy for people to understand. And so, like, uh, have you ever done the keto diet? I'm not asking you have you ever gone a day without a carb. I'm asking you if you've ever actually put in like weeks or months at a time on it. Like, yes, I, everyone's had a meal without a carb before, you know. And so that, that's not a good answer. The answer is like, have you ever actually seen it seen it play through? And that's the same thing on the training side. Um, I, I think the the big thing is an education of, of what a process it is. And so one of the things I think we do really well at CSP and we've done really well since well before I was here um, was make things, um, you know, process oriented versus outcome oriented. And so why I'm bringing this up is, is I want to get a kid in and get him not to want to throw 95 miles an hour. Everybody, every pitcher should want to throw 95 miles an hour at some point, but you can't approach every training session and say, I'm going to throw 95 miles an hour after this training session. You have to approach it as, all right, I want to feel good after this session. I want to do everything well within it. I want to be excited for the next time I come to train. I want to finish this four week program in exactly four weeks. I want to not miss a session this off season. And we have guys not miss sessions for entire off seasons because, because the, the goal isn't, and we have plenty of guys who miss sessions. So don't let me mis mislead you into thinking that, that nobody missed a session. But the goal is not how quickly can I get to the outcome? The goal is how can I embrace this process and see this continual improvement? Because if I can get you to embrace a process for an entire off season, you're more than likely going to embrace that process throughout the season. And so what, what that means is everybody's going to struggle in season. I don't mean just from a training side. I mean, from a, from a performance side, everybody's going to hit a slump. It's baseball, right? Both on pitching and, and the hitting side. And so if your goals or if the way you structure your mindset around your goals for everything you do, including the off season is about the outcome, right? It's all about the outcome. Then when you hit that slump in, in mid June or whenever people start playing again, if you hit that slump, your goal is going to be like, Oh my God, I have to get a hit next time. I have to do this. I have to do this. Like, no, you've got to step back and figure out what, what the, the adjustments you have to make and, and look at it like a process approach. And so, I just think it's a much better long-term outcome for people when they do it that way. Uh, the kids we have, I think, who fizzle out are the kids who are like, I need to deadlift 500 pounds and I'm going to sell out to do it. And they don't do it. Or maybe they do it. And then once they do it, it's like boring to them. Or, or they never do it. So they think training is a failure. Um, something like that. Instead of the kids who are just like, hey, I want you to show up four days a week um, for 90 minutes. And I want you to do that for, for three, four straight months. And if you do that and you do not have success that you're hoping to have, then that's on me. Then I failed. But otherwise I can't look at it as a failure of what we did. Um, and so it's very important to me in the initial evaluation process, especially with the younger guys. I think the older guys embrace that really quickly, but especially with the younger guys, because everything is, everything is the next moment, the next moment. Oh, what's my, What's my perfect game rating? Oh, can I, can I move it up 10 spots in my next showcase? Like, yep. it doesn't matter. What matters is, can you perform over a long period of time? 
Um, and the guys who can do that are the guys who are successful in this game. Like everyone knows the 14 year old phenom that, that barely plays college baseball. Right. Everyone grew up with one of those, right. You can picture them in your head. Everyone also grew up with someone who was like a B team kid. I don't even know if people still do that. I don't think they do A and B teams anymore, but was like a B team kid or, or barely played varsity as a junior or barely didn't make varsity as a sophomore and started to really climb, then walked onto his college team, then played four years. And so that story is much more interesting to me than the story of the 14 year old who barely played in college or who didn't play in college at all. Um, and so I want to, and now where, where the magic happens is if you can take a kid who is that 14 year old phenom, right. And get him to embrace the B team mentality of, I need to work hard. I need to earn this. That's a kid who's not, not only going to play through college, but maybe play professionally and going to really excel throughout it. And so I think you have to, if you're, if you're a high school kid, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be the best player right now or the best player you can be for the next six years? Right. And even the best players right now, if they can embrace that long-term approach, that's where they're really going to be successful. From a practical application standpoint, um, whether it's you or the interns or other um, strength and conditioning coaches, whoever it is working with the players, what, is there something that – is it just kind of hammered into their head, that type of process or that type of theory? Yeah. Is it something that they're tracking within their workout? Is it something where they're like, watch it. How do you really drill that into their head? Like, is there yeah. a common theme that's coming up that you're doing that's really, really good question? Um, I am, I'll put it this way do I occasionally get, um, this comes off as, I guess, very militant, like, you're going to do this, this, this. I've occasionally had to get on kids. I don't want to. I don't think any coach really wants to. I just think they have to. They just think they think they have to sometimes. Um, and so I think what it is is if I never have to have a conversation with a kid about his work ethic, it's a home run, right? And so the way I'll phrase that is not so much make it about me or make it about the kid. It's uh, everything I'll explain to them is the people who are successful here do this. And so now going back to kind of tying it with the previous question, every kid wants to be like, you know, roll the Chapman throw 105 miles an hour at some point, right? So that like everybody has those idols, right? Um, but if instead of looking up to those guys who you don't have in your facility, if you can just say, all right, the people who are successful here, this is what they do. Right. And now all of a sudden they're kind of falling in line. So we have, we have incredible buy-in. And I think it's for that reason is the we don't, I'm trying to think of a PG word to use here. We don't get bad people as pro guys who last for a while. And we're really fortunate in that regard. Is the occasional guy now a great guy? Of course, right? You're not going to go 100%. But the high-level college guys we have and the pro guys who we have, who these kids see, or maybe they see on social media and they meet once and it makes their year, right? Who these guys see in our facility and they know they're connected with us. They know that so our high school kids don't usually overlap with our, with our pro guys. And it's just time of day. Like they come in after school, but they see on social media, Hey, this morning you were working with so-and-so, right? Like, yeah. And then if I explain to them, like, yeah, but those guys, here's what they do. Right. They, they show up on time, if not early, uh, they execute everything in the program. They do things um, with intent. And I don't mean physical intent because, and yes, there's physical intent involved, but sometimes when you, I think sometimes when I've used the word intent with, with kids, they're just like, all right, I'm going as hard as I can on everything. Um, and when it's like not, not the time and place with, with a, I guess an intellectual or a mental intent, I think is, is equally, if not more important on the training side. Um, it's definitely more important on the, on the baseball side of having, having the mindset, like as a pitcher, if you just get up there and like, oh, I just allowed a hit. I need to throw as hard as I can next pitch. Probably the wrong way to go about it. Right. You need to say, all right, let me, let me, let me relax. Let me calm down. Let me hit my spot, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, I think it's the same thing on the training side. I just think people don't always realize that because our, our training, our training education for our athletes at this point, um, I think, I think social media is very fortunate in that we have constant connection to our athletes. Um, like I, so I posted and I'll, I'll backtrack here, but I posted every day for like a month when this quarantine first started and I, I don't love social media, but backtrack that. So like I don't normally post every day. Um, and I put, and it was, it was to kind of stay in our athletes' minds. And I did it for a couple of days in a row. And I started getting these texts and Instagram messages being like, oh, I love it. Keep doing it. Keep putting it out. Like, and it wasn't like, I don't care if I appeal to other people in the field or my friends from high school or college or whatnot, but 
But if my athletes are engaged with what I'm putting out, it motivates me to put that, put it out. So our in, social media is great in that regard. You can stay in an athlete's mind. You can stay in your player's minds, even when you're not with them. Right. And so then they start to think like, all right, what would he want me to do in this scenario? Um, would he want me to skip this set or would he, would he want me just to like kind of blow it off or would he want me to actually put some intent and purpose into it? So all of a sudden it's like making your athletes training sessions better, even when you're not around them, if you can stay present in their mind. Um, the flip side is I think people see these snapshots and assume that's all it is. So they see so-and-so professional athlete doing this one exercise that maybe they're a freak show at and they're moving 315 pounds on, on a reverse lunge or whatever it is. And like, Oh, I got to do that. And it's like, no, actually we have a lot of guys who are really successful who can't do that. So they're just, they're just special in that regard. Right. And it's just, it's just unique. It's, it's, there's a reason they're posting on social media because, because social media is like the highlights of our life. Right. It's like, I'm going to post the cool things that happen. So you've got to assume that, that, that 30 seconds you saw that guy training is a lot more to what he does than just that. And so um, I think that's where you kind of, kind of run into trouble with kids, kids seeing that stuff. But I do like it from a standpoint of, of like staying present in kids' minds. Um, what was your original question? I apologize. No, the original question, no, because I know you answered oh. it. And I wrote a bunch of Oh, it was questions. saying, saying uh, uh, keeping that like more process minded goal in, uh, with clients. Um, I think, I think it's just, it's just, it's taking what they want, which is relating to these pro guys and these higher level guys. It's, um, and it's combining what they can do. So here's one thing, like coaches growing up, they always tell you, like, you can, you can always hustle. You can always do this, this, and this. Um, and people think it's like, oh, that's a, that's what happens in the baseball field. That's what happens in life. That's what happens in the gym. And so you can always show up on time, right? Like if it's in your control and there's not a car accident or traffic jam or whatnot, you can always show up on time, all right? You can always do everything that's on your sheet because you're paying for the product, right? You can always do things thoughtfully and within and like you're into it, right? And so if you're taking a test in school, you're not going to be like, oh, whatever, I'll just answer this question wrong and then move on. You might, but it's not a, it's not a good approach. It's the same, same thing in the gym. So I, I see a lot of kids who, when they come in, and I'll speak more on the college side with this answer, but the college, because kids, kids are lifting at six in the morning, four days a week in college. And at some point it just feels like a classroom. Right. And so I, I think technique a lot of the time in that, in that population kind of gets pushed over and it's not the strength coach's fault. They've got 40 guys, two coaches, right. Or 30 and one, whatever crazy ratio. But now they're in a setting like ours in which most of the time we live in a three to one client to coach ratio where our capacity is five to one, but most of the time we live three to one, uh, three or four to one. Um, and now all of a sudden people see every rep they do and it's like, you're being watched taking a test, you know, like you've got to, you've got to like, like don't do it unless you're going to do it uh, full effort. And so all of a sudden I think we get a lot of results from kids who are like, you know, I've done these exercises before. I've just never done them like this. Yeah. And so I'll ask kids in the eval, like, Oh, like if the, if you do have a training background, what have you done? They're like deadlifted, squatted, you know, I've done quote crusty stuff, whatever that means. It's like we didn't invent weightlifting. It was around before that. Um, uh, but they've done all this stuff. And then we give them the program like, yeah, yeah, I've done this. I've done this before. Like, and, and then they do it. It's like, you haven't done it the way we want you to do it. And so it's very, very much like every rep in the gym is like throwing a pitch, right? You're not going to go out and just be like, I'll put this one over the middle, see what happens. You know? Um, and so I think, I think getting kids to embrace that mindset of the 90 minutes you're there, yeah, you're gonna have fun. You're gonna you're gonna talk to us in between. We'll talk about stuff unrelated. We'll laugh, like. But when you're in the set, you're in the set, right? And so you like every every rep on that sheet that matters. There's a reason we put it there. You paid for it. And so um, I think that's that's where a lot of our success lies. Like I see I see a lot of programs from different places, whether it's private settings, um, college setting, whatnot, and. Um, the exercises aren't that different. We might package them a little differently. We might individualize them a little more. Um, we might choose not to do certain things with certain individuals, right? Uh, for whatever reason we see in an assessment, but it's the, the intent and the purpose that we do these, this stuff with that I think is very, very different than what kids are used to. That's great. So talking about specifically with exercise. Yeah. The, uh, the last guest we had on talking a lot of the same stuff was Ryan Fair with the Cleveland Indians. I don't know if you know him. But, I think I met him. I, the name sounds super familiar. I think I met him once. If I have Ryan and you're seeing this, I apologize. Um, that name is super familiar. 
So I had him choose one exercise that if he had to highlight, it's maybe not the one exercise, but only picking one exercise where he thought was one of the most important to then highlight and talk about how it translates through all kinds of areas of training into baseball. He picked the push-up, so you can't pick the push-up. If you had to pick another exercise that is whether it's undertrained or misunderstood or not trained well or whatever it is, what's that exercise, why, and then how does it translate to baseball? Sure. Um, it is admittedly hard um, to pick one because uh, I'll answer one of them. One of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to answer one, and then I'm going to answer kind of a little more on that. But um, I would probably pick a deadlift variation, and I think the reason uh, is the the ability to get into hip flexion. So hip flexion for athletes listening is when your your upper body and your your upper legs come closer together, right? So my uh, you know, my knees are coming towards my chest. My chest is coming towards my knees, et cetera. It's that idea. Um, and so the ability to get into hip flexion, into hip extension. So I want you to think about like loading a jump and unloading a jump. Your hips, your hips bend, your hips, your hips straighten. Um, the ability to do that is prevalent in all of baseball. It's prevalent in a lot of sports, but specifically baseball, um, because you can't throw a ball without your hips moving like that. And you can't swing a bat without your hips moving like that. Uh, when you feel the ball, you get into that position. Um, but specifically throwing and hitting, if you can do that really, really powerfully, we can work with that and start to translate that. Um, but if that's a if that's a if that's a weak spot, you could have the best mechanics in the world. But if you can't fire through your hips, or if you can't load your hips and, and unload through your hips and put force into the ground as you do it, um, you're gonna have a tough time throwing hard. Um, that doesn't mean like if you deadlift a lot, you throw hard. I did, I. I deadlift a, a more than a lot of people and I don't throw hard at all. And so it's not a one-to-one, -one, right? Um, but it is, it is saying that if we get a kid and they can't move a whole lot of weight on that, that's something that we're going to, that we're going to train and we're going to train hard. Um, so that would probably be my, my number one. Um, I think exercise is a lot more holistic than we give it, we give it credit for sometimes because the, like the kind of Instagram social media culture looks at it and it's like kids season exercise, they need to do it. Whereas it's not so much the exercise, it's where the exercise fits, um, what your weak spots are, how much of it you do, what intensity you do it at, what kind of quality you do it with. Um, and so all those things are factors and variables that go into, into transfer. Um, but if somebody can hinge, so a hinge is, is the, that hip position that I'm talking about. So it's basically your chest coming towards your knees without rounding your spine. Right. Um, so it's, it's, uh, your hips bend, but your back doesn't put it that way. Um, that's how I'll, exp I'll explain it to kids. Um, but if you can do that really, really well and put force in the ground, we can start to use that action in sports. We can, that's, that's something that we're going to be able to translate into a lot of different things. Absolutely. So let's transition into the internship program. Yeah. Um, so I want to know more about it. So just briefly, give me your elevator pitch on how I heard you say Pete kind of handed it off to you because you were running with it. How did that get handed off? Like, why was it handed off to you? What was going on? What's your elevator pitch on why you were able to take control of it? Yeah, good question. Um, I wanted to, I guess would be the first part. And, <laughs> the and <end>. it was, <laughs> um, it's not a job that everybody wants. Um, because it's additional hours. It's, um, you know, you're dealing with 22 year olds who sometimes aren't your best friends. Um, uh, nothing wrong with 22 year olds, but it's like the, the, the most interns aren't people that I want to hang out with. They're not like my best friends, you know, they're, they're, they're essentially like students. Right. And, that, and I've, I've become friends with some of the interns, but, um, I like, uh, you guys could probably tell, I like talking shop because it is probably my, the easiest way for me to get better at what I do. Um, and what I mean by that is if I can answer your questions and I can answer their questions, I can sure as hell answer our athletes questions. And I can start to formulate these ideas in my mind of this is what I believe in things. Cause I answered the question. Like I, I answered the question that way. That's actually, so kind of backstory when you had asked me about pre-planned questions, I hate pre-planned questions. And the reason is if I know what's coming, I think too much about the answer. Right. And so if I don't know what's coming, I'm like, all right, let me tell you what I actually think. Right. What, what, what comes to mind. Uh, so that would have been summer 2017 uh, when I started here. I was probably three and a half years into the field, five and a half years or so into learning about the field. And 
Um, you know, our interns, most of them are within their first year in the field. And so I definitely, I didn't, I felt like a young coach, but I felt like an old coach compared to them. Um, still, still think of myself as a young coach, but might not be compared to a lot of people. Um, but um, I started to realize like, Hey, like if I start to teach these, and selfishly, I was like, if I start to teach these kids, I'm going to get a lot better. Like I'm going to make myself better doing this. And that was like, that was the first enti enticing part to me. And then the other component of it was, well, we write programs, right? So as coaches, we write programs and we have a mix of coaches and interns coaching them. So our floor is 15,000 square feet. For those of you who haven't seen it online, but um, we'll have three, four coaches walking around and with an equal amount of interns usually walking around, kind of floating around the floor coaching. So I'm not going to see every rep, like me personally, I'm not going to see every rep that happens in one of my programs, right? But there's a really good chance somebody will. And if that somebody is not as good at their job as I want them to be, that's frustrating to me because competitively, if I write a program, I want to see it executed well. And so I started to realize like, all right, I can only coach a couple athletes at a time, right? In terms of like the in, 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 individual instance. So I might be able to see somebody doing this set here, somebody doing this set here, but somebody, you know, 40 yards away from me in the gym, I can't, I can't watch them at the same time, right? Um, but I realized if I can help train coaches' eyes young interns to be better coaches, I can all of a sudden like quadruple the amount of athletes I'm coaching at one time that I'm, that I'm helping at one time. And so for me, it was, you know, one was the selfish reason. Two was like, all right, like my programs are going to be a lot more effective if they coach better. Right. That was, that is just like the, the that was the, the root of it. And I started doing it and I, I really fell in love with it. Um, it's probably one of my favorite parts about the job. I mean, it's every, Every three or four months, we get a new class of five to seven interns, um, and they they have a lot of times the same questions, um, but my answers are way better than they used to be. And so I used to be like, oh, I don't know about that. And now it's like, all right, I know that question because I've been asked it five semesters in a row. And because of that, if I can give more confident answers to questions, I can get better questions. And so it's, it's like a continual cycle. Um, and so, and the other thing is too, like, as you – evolve as a coach as a professional whatever field it's in like what you do day to day is going to change or have some rollover right like yeah are my programs the same they were three years ago to someone not in the field they'd probably be like yeah it kind of looks the same type the, the font on the paper is the same the the, the format's the same whatnot um but are my reasons different are the the exact choices potentially different or maybe different advanced methods for different people whatever it is that stuff's constantly changing and so I'll get athletes who like come back after, you know, go through six months off season, leave for six months, come back and they're doing stuff they've never done before. And they're like, what is this? I'm like, well, what do you think? We're, I'm, like, I didn't get any better in the last six months. Um, or like, I didn't learn anything in the last six months. So it's not hundred percent new, but there's a couple things in there that they've never done before. And even guys have been training with us for years. I think that's what, I think that's something that allows our guys to keep coming back. Like I talked to one of our pro guys today about, you know, coming in when we reopen and, and he's been coming here for like five, six years. And, uh, and I'm kind of like, in my head, I'm like, this kid's been there five, six years. He knows what he's doing. Like he knows what he's doing on his own. I'm like talking to him about what kind of equipment he has. He's like, honestly, I just want to get back in. Cause I know there's some stuff that you're going to see that you're going to coach me on that, that I'm not doing right now. And that was like really refreshing to me. Um, and so if I can kind of instill that mindset with the, with younger coaches, with other, um, you know, interns. And I also had a lot of, um, yeah, I mentioned Ranfone Training Systems, three coaches there that were awesome. Um, I mentioned CSP Florida. I mentioned working at my, uh, in my job in college. I had a lot of awesome mentors that I feel like allowed me to skip steps. And so if you don't have a mentor or somebody that's helping you guide your questions or what you're reading or what you're learning, and which is probably the case in any field, it's going to be really hard to continue to ask good questions. And because you're, what you're going to wind up doing is you're going to wind up spending a lot of time looking into something that really doesn't matter. Right. And so having a mentor or someone to, to, to be around to kind of guide you in that front, I think is really, really important, especially, um, and I know, I think the baseball field the same way from a pitching side, because there's like a million schools of thought on pitching. And a lot of them, a lot of them think they're totally unique when there's actually a ton of overlap. Um, uh, but I, especially in the training side, because there's like this method versus this method versus this method. When in reality, these are not competing methods. It's just figuring out when to use what and if you have any value for what in your setting. And um, it's kind of deciphering how to, um, how to learn. And I think um, the, probably the biggest takeaway from my college education, um, because 
I was a math major who took a bunch of science classes, who also was on the student newspaper and took a bunch of other random classes that I thought were interesting. I just took classes that were interesting. I didn't like take classes that were, uh, a lot of kids would be like, all right, I'm taking two hard classes and two easy classes. I'm just going to pick those. I tried to take four classes that I, that I would actually want to listen during for all of college for per semester. And I think the biggest thing that taught me was the ability to critically think and observe things and actually decipher what you should be learning about in any field. Um, and so I don't think a lot of people get that education because they think they get these very one track mind of being like, all right, this is the kind of coach I am. This is what I'm going to do. When in reality, if you're just pigeonholed into one little box, chances are that box is changing and you're not even aware of it because the guys who invented it have already changed what they're doing. Um, but it, it limits you a lot as a coach. Like I think it's the same thing in baseball. If you're like, I'm the, this guy and we only use this tool to learn how to pitch. What happens if that tool changes? What happens if the creators of that tool change how they're using it and you're not aware of that? Then all of a sudden you're just totally missing the boat on everything else. Um, and so I, I think that's, um, I always tell our interns this um, because they ask about like what we're going to learn. And I'm like, you'll learn a lot on the practical side uh, in terms of getting coaching reps and seeing how people interact as a coach. You will get a lot on the theoretical side. Like we'll talk, we'll talk, um, you know, percentages in training. We'll talk velocity based training. We'll talk, uh, you know, the ground reaction time and sprinting, whatever it is. We'll talk about like things that sound advanced, but in reality, what I'm trying to teach you or what I'm trying to teach them is how to think as a coach. And how to how to critically problem solve so that you don't become the coach that's pigeonholed into one thing. Um, that was a long winded answer, but uh, that, you can probably tell it's something I'm, I'm I think about a lot or I'm interested in because I, I always want to know if something works. Like if I see a coach getting better, like an intern getting better in front of me, and I'm like, oh, they're two months in and they are a rock star coach right now, and they couldn't coach anything they want. I want to know what changed, like what worked there. And there's never like one answer. It's always like, oh, well, I just viewed it from this way. Da, 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 da. I never get good answers on that. And I think it's, I think it's because we, we teach them how to think. Yep. No, no, well, I've got some really good news. Our last topic, our twins critique is actually going to jump back into the internship program. So I'm actually yeah. going to pick your brain a little bit more with that. Yeah. So to set this up for the twins critique, what it is, and I already prepped you, I always prep everyone just to have an idea of what the heck this is. So it's a, it's a chance for me to tell everyone who's watching that's never heard about our program or doesn't know about our program, what we have to offer, what's important to us. And then with all of that, one of the big things that is important that I will mention as well, so kind of a third thing, is that we're always trying to learn and evolve from the best people. So being able to ask the expert is an awesome opportunity. So I'll set it up with the two things that are most important to us. Number one is that we all speak the same language. So we're an organization traveling baseball that has 8U all the way up to 17U with our college guys coming back to train occasionally and if we don't have all of our coaches and instructors saying the same thing then it's the problem that's been happening for you know decades now in any industry whether it's sports or whatever whatever it is so we started our first um, coaches certification this year we've had it in a few different ways in years past but we finally kind of made it official where you were taking a test in your specific area so now across the board our instructors and coaches are all definitely speaking the same language. They've been tested on it. The second most important thing is that we are an all encompassing organization for the same cost of what everyone else is charging for jerseys and um, practice and coaches stipends and travel and tournaments. You're also getting with us that and a 20 week off season program that includes hitting mental training and pitching for all 20 weeks. You're also getting catching infield outfield, base running, and I'm probably forgetting some kind of mini camps throughout that. So being able to, one, all speak the same language, and then two, offer everything kind of in-house. So with that said, I want to pick your brain um, again on the internship program with us kind of starting to standardize the coaches certification. I want to hear a little bit about what you've learned in the last couple of years uh, with doing that. And I guess I'll more kind of niche down the question with how do you – improve it because I know you have different rounds of interns and there's different years of interns how have you gone back to look back at your notes what's that process look like and what are the things that you're trying to tweak to make it better sure um first off I love what you guys do from a organizing language across the board like I don't think you don't need robots as coaches who um 
you know, call the same pitch at the same time for at every level, like, Oh, it's Oh two, you have to throw this pitch. Like that doesn't, that doesn't work in real life. Right. Um, but I do think you need people who believe in common ground. Um, and so I think that's something we are, we are good at. Um, I guess my process for the whole thing is um, I like learning a lot about coaches um, because I think, I think sometimes people in our field, they just learn from scientists and researchers and people like that. Uh, the people I've learned more, the most from in terms of reading is like John Wooden, Vince Lombardi, Bill Belichick, people like that. There's so much gold if coaches actually read that stuff and figure out what, what they did well. Um, and I think one of the, the, the common grounds is, is the ability to adapt your own system, but also the ability to know what your system is in the first place. And so I think sometimes people learn stuff new and they just throw it in there, but they don't know what it replaces. And so like, I bet every successful coach in professional college sports, like looks at game film of what they did and looks at their playbook and looks at scouting reports and then modifies based off what they already have. They don't just throw new things in there because they, they, they want new things. Right. Um, and so for me as a, with our, our program, um, I spent the first three semesters leading it, um, basically creating lesson plans, like individual lesson plans. And so I meet with the interns one to two days a week before work for roughly an hour, um, for the whole semester. So, probably talking somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, like a 16 week internship. You're probably talking 30 to 40 hours somewhere in that neighborhood of like just classroom education. So um, I can't remember how long college classes, but I, I feel like it's close to a college course in terms of what we get. Right. Um, in addition to practical and the first three semesters I did that, I just created like individual lesson plans. And so I'd be like, all right, this is what I want to go over and we're going to go over that. And this is what I want to go over. And everything was like individual. So it'd be like, it'd be like in a sports setting, you show up to practice and today we're working on, on situational hitting and we're just going to do that. And then the next practice is something else. And the next practice is something else, but you're not totally aware of the order. And I wasn't either because I was trying to figure out as I went. Um, right. So I just, you know, night, two nights before I'd create these like lesson plans. Hey, we, we need to go over programming. We're going to do that. And I create that. And then after probably the, th the third semester, I started to really organize it. Um, and that semester I started to really organize it where like things fit. It was like, Oh, I've noticed if we do this before this, then it works. Right. And so here's, and so I've actually built it out to about a 45 page document right now. That is basically just my thoughts slash lesson plans on paper. Um, and I actually have a whole section in the back of it that I haven't finished at all. So I haven't even used. And so I'm looking at probably, like a 55, 60 page book that is, I don't want to say hundred percent thought based, but it's, it's like I'll reference things in there, but it's definitely the longest paper I've ever written. Um, and so it'll be like, it'll be like, all right, this is what we're covering. And then now, ever since I did that, it's very, very easy to organize off of that. And so like you guys talk about having like your career, like a, it's a curriculum, right? It's just a really yeah. long curriculum. Um, and so if you, if I want to do something new, I want to teach something new. I can look at that and say, all right, what does this replace in here? What does this fit? And then what will happen is like, I'll teach, like I've been operating off this curriculum, which has changed every semester, like something in it has changed every semester. Um, not, not a ton, but like something in it has. And so what will happen is I'll have like something worded in a way where people ask like questions, people just like don't get it, like multiple semesters, semesters in a row. I'm like, all right, well that, that one needs to change then. Like I need to change how I teach that. Um, and so it's, it's a constant evaluation of that. I think we're a lot of times these things go wrong, trying to like learn about systems and coaching and implementation. And, and, and really I think the, the idea of like having a treating people as assistant coaches, so like interns are not, they're, they're just assistant coaches. Like I, I got to organize them to think alike. Like I don't need them all to do the same thing, but I need them to think something that's somewhat alike. Um, kind of giving, uh, where's it going with that? Kind of giving them like freedom to get better at what they want to get better at as long as they check what, the boxes that I need them to check. Right. And so, yeah, like if you have somebody who they're really passionate about this and you don't teach that, that's fine, but you just can't do that instead of my stuff. You have to do that in addition. Yeah. Right. So I, I think of it as the curriculum is like the minimum, well, the minimum of what you need to know to be successful. Right. It's the, it's the bare minimum. And I always tell interns that. So one thing I've done multiple semesters that I really like doing from like a motivational standpoint is I'll teach like the most complicated in service that we do all semester during the last week. And the reason is like, like the last week interns, like last couple of weeks, like, yeah, I got this. I know everything. I'm just going to go out in the world and crush it. 
And yeah. then I'll teach like the, the stuff that's not in the curriculum. That's like the, 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 the most complicated stuff that I can confidently teach. And they'll leave me like, I have so much more to learn. And that's, that to me is like a big reward because now I'm not trying to confuse people, but I want people to leave and realize that I gave you the bare minimum. You know, I gave you the minimum of what you need to know as a coach. And so um, I think the, the important things there are you need someone who is like a kind of like a gatekeeper role. And so the gatekeeper is like the person who has final say on what gets put in that, in that certification of that text. Um, but you also need that gatekeeper to not be attached to any one ideology um, and this is, I'm just more speaking from what I try to do. Uh, I don't want to get attached to any one ideology. I want to promote discussion within my staff, um, because if I can promote discussion, chances are they're going to have a question that prompts a good question in my head, or they're going to teach me something. Like if they can add something to what I'm doing, like sweet, I don't have to learn that myself. Um, and so I, like we have, I would say half our in-services, so in-services staff and interns, we do those once a week. Um, and we meet half of those are round table and I'll guide them because I think it's important to have a guide in those, but I'll say, um, one of the best ones I think we ever did in, or we did like this off season was, Hey, I want to go over, um, uh, return to play training from a lower body injury. I have no agenda on this. I just want to know what people in the room know on this. I've got a couple thoughts. I'm going to both point them on the board and we're going to talk. And then we talk for an hour and, uh, like, um, I think if those aren't guided, if you're just like, hey, let's sit down and talk shop, they can go anywhere. But if you have a really specific topic like that, hey, what do we do in this scenario? Here are my two or three bullet points that we're going to talk about. That's teaching, right? That's how you can really promote discussion and learn. And um, so I don't know. I know I'm sure for in your situation, like having a bunch of coaches spread out is difficult um, from a let's all sit down and talk perspective. But I think if you have a gatekeeper or a guy that's like, hey, this is – you know, and you talk to the people individually and you say, what keeps coming? And you realize, like, hey, multiple people on my staff have the same questions. Why don't we talk about it, right? And um, so if that gatekeeper can kind of guide those discussions and everybody gets better at that, at, at, because maybe, maybe there's a coach in the room who hadn't yet arrived at that question, who in three months was going to have that same question. You just expedited his process, right? And so I think that's, that's super valuable. And a lot of times, like, I think some of the higher level sports teams, people think like, oh, pro sports, they must be, they must have everything together. What they're missing is the bridge between, between departments, right? So like our, our in-services, like we, we have pitching coaches in there. We have PTs in there. We have massage therapists who's, who's there most of the time. Like, um, like we have multiple school, uh, multiple lanes within our business that are there. We have guest speakers, probably once a month on average and guest speakers aren't just like, Hey, talk to us. It's like, no, we want to learn this from you. Like, like here's the thing we need to talk about. Um, so zoning in what people are trying to learn um, and, you know, just creating, creating conversation. And I think um, one of the, one of the super valuable things for me has been, um, this is going to come off negative. It's not, uh, I'm not like best friends with anyone on our staff. Right. And I don't feel like I need to be um, like I have really close you know, like the people I used to work with in New York. I'm still close, really close to a couple of them um, more so than the people I work with right now. But um, I don't need to be your best friend, but I do need to be your friend in order for you to want to talk to me and let's talk shop, you know. And so I think a lot of young coaches confuse that um, in any field. Of like, all right, I'm going to hang out with this guy all the time. We're just going to do this. This is like, no, like, like we're going to care for each other. We're going to care about what we do and we're going to be friends and, um, being a leader is being, is caring about the people first. Um, and I guess that's a very long winded answer to that question, but something, so one thing I, I see a lot of younger coaches do, especially when they first leave this internship, like I'll talk, keep in touch with former interns. They'll be like, be like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm here. And I just, I'm so frustrated by what the people around me are doing. They're just not doing anything that we would do at CSP. Like, I'm like, like, I just want to, I just want to teach them stuff. And I'm like, have you earned the right to teach them at all? Like, why would they want to learn from you? You gotta, you gotta be friends with them first. Like nobody wants unsolicited advice. Like unsolicited advice is one of the worst things you can give a human being. Like you're walking down the street, you don't like the way someone looks and you say something about it. That's very, very negative, very negative. If you're best friends with somebody and you want to give them a hard time about the way he looks, that, that's totally fine, right? In a lot of relationships. Um, and so it's the same concept professionally. I think people have to realize that like, you're going to have coaches that you, you don't agree with everything they do. Um, and you're probably never going to have a coach that you agree with hundred percent of what they do. 
um, but you have to be friends with them. You have to, you have to earn the right on a human level to give them any feedback or information. Like people want to be taught once they know the person cares about them. Well, long winded nice. answer, but I, I wanted a long winded answer. Of course, not an hour, but I wanted a long winded answer <laughs> because I don't know as much about your guys internship program. Yeah. So, and it's somewhere we've been trying to go and, making bigger strides with our um, certification and it gave me some really good ideas on how to structure that um, because coming in the fall I'm gonna have some more time dedicated toward baseball away from my full-time job yeah that will allow me to kind of get well, honestly one of the probably the biggest mistake I've made in the last three years with interns is just not knowing a whole lot about them as human beings before teaching them um, and just and continuing to keep that in mind like I've had multiple instances where I'm like embarrassed and I'm like, I can't remember where like I went to college and he just graduated college and I interviewed him and I looked at his resume, like, and he wears the shirt sometimes. And I just can't remember. Like, I should know that, you know, I'm around the guy all the time. I should know if he has a girlfriend or not. Uh, I should know where he lives right now. Like, you know, stuff like that. Like um, it, it's for me after doing that multiple times, it's kind of embarrassing to not I realize that like, all right, I've been teaching this guy and like kind of telling him like, pushing him or guiding him or telling him what to do for months. And I don't know anything about him. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's the mistake I definitely made. And I think that's something that I try to not let happen now. And like I said, I don't need to be best friends with them, but I, I, I feel like on a human level, I should, I should care for them and, and know, know enough about them so that I have earned the right to teach them. And I think, I think coaching wise the same. And I think I see that a lot in like a more of a coach player side than a coach coach side. Um, and, and we don't, I think sometimes like the, I don't want to say mental skills are overblown. I think sometimes we're really easy on kids these days. Um, oh, the teenagers are going through a hard time. Like, um, they've got all this, this, and this pressure. Um, but uh, we don't need to coddle them, but we do need to know what they care about, you know, and, and know something about them. Yep. I completely agree because by coddling them, it's not because we don't want to be hard on them, it, or that's not really the concern. It's that these we're all humans. We're incredibly capable, so we can expect yeah. a lot out of them. So yeah, and it's like I said, like if it's if it's effort related, I'm not going to coddle you. Like I know you can do that. I'm 100 percent confident you, you can you can show up on time and work hard and do do what you're supposed to do. Right? Um, if it's not effort related, I'm not going to get on people on it. You know, it's the same. It's, I think it's, that's like anything. Like one, I think one of the worst things coaches do is like, I, I can like, you can, if you pitch growing up, you can still hear this with like a random coach just yelling like throw a strike. It's like, yeah, I, I, I was actually trying to put that ball outside the zone for the last eight pitches. Right. Um, things like that. It just, it, it, to me, that's just bad coaching at this point that stuff like that in our industry needs to change. Um, but stuff that is, that is about like, Hey, doing, doing things successfully, trying to teach kids how to, how to mentally deal with, like when you are going through that situation um, of, you know, walking the bases loaded on 12 pitches or whatever it is, like just yelling at the kid to throw a strike is like the worst thing you can do, you know? Um, and so it's, it's, it's really just dealing with people's uh, anxiety has a negative connotation, but really the, um, you're working with like arousal levels and all right, this person's, too fired up, I need to calm down. This person's too calm, I need to fire them up. And it's just being able to read that as a coach. And I think the more experience you get and the more you are willing to ask yourself and critically evaluate, like, did that work or did that not work, the better the better off it is. Like, I, I, I would love to sit down with, with coaches who yell throw a strike and be like, how often does that work? Like, like tell me how often that completely changed your kid, you know, and, and things like that. And I, I'm picking on one cue, so I hope, I hope there's not someone there who's like, oh, I use that a lot. Um, but, but there are several like that in both fitness training and, and baseball that I don't think match the person's arousal level to where you want, because to play sports, do you want to be fired up? Yeah. Do you want to be calm? Yeah. But you got to be able to go back and forth, especially in baseball. Like, like baseball players are not middle linebackers. You can't, you can't, you can't be fired up for, for seven innings. If you get the ball hit to you three times, you know? Um, and so you need to be able to, to, turn it on, turn it off and kind of play everything in between. Um, and as a coach, I think that's, that's a big part of our job is, is, is pushing the kids who need to be pushed a little more. You push them, the kids who need to pull back a little more, you pull them back and then, and then trying to time that correctly. Well, I completely agree. No, the one, I'll, I'll end it with this. I had a, play, a coach, old school coach in college who would pace up and down 
the uh, dugout, frustrated with the pitcher, who not only would say make a good pitch or throw a strike, he would just like throw his arms and be a pitcher. <laughs> I was like, That's it. I had a, I had a coach who every time a catcher dropped the ball or had a pass ball, he would yell first five letters. And first five letters would mean like catch, like catch the ball. And he would just, just every time. And so we had like, we had one catcher who struggled defensively and, and every time just get on and it never worked. <laughs> that was perfect. All right, John, well, as we wrap this up, where can people follow you? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so my Instagram is at O'Neill Strength, same as Twitter. Um, I always respond to like direct messages and whatnot. I don't post a ton of content. It's not um, super interesting to me. Um, it's not super interesting to me to put myself out there. If I do it, it's for my athletes. Um, i trying to think. I follow – I like sports and, and news and stuff like that more so than training stuff on Instagram. So I kind of assume that people are getting enough training stuff on Instagram, but who knows. Um, uh, but you can contact me through there. Um, if you have like a longer question and you DM me, I'll shoot you my email. Um, I'll always get back to people and stuff like that. Um, especially like athletes and players. Um, I think oftentimes they're the ones with the best questions and they might not be the best, like, Oh, that's a better question than coach than a coach. But it's a question that I could, might be able to help more with uh, just because a lot of times coaches ask questions that have to do with like practical logistics. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I understand your setting but I think I can help you if you're a player, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we will kind of cap it off. So, John, I appreciate it. I'll have to keep, keep, keep stay on for a second after this, if you don't mind. But sure. otherwise, thank you yeah. everyone for tuning in. Absolutely. Well, Scott, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I hope hopefully people got – I know we were talking about before, but um, when it, for the consumers, like whenever I listen to podcasts, like one, I want an interesting conversation. I feel like we had that. I, I, like we checked that box um two uh hopefully there's like one or two takeaways that i'm like i can use that and i, I and I, I i hope that we provided that for you so i appreciate all you guys listening scott i appreciate you for having me all right yeah thanks john thank you